The Lover Upon Trial, pages 33 to 60 in this book. That means I'm finishing when they return to the Grange after their outing. We see a bit of better writing from the author here. She's moving out of introduction mode and into the actual story. And that's a good thing. Her writing flows quite well. I didn't like Lydia in this chapter. But I do find her very relatable. She's in a rotten position. And nobody is listening when she says, no, she doesn't like this man. Admittedly, she's not really thinking about it the way she should. She's not giving him a chance. So maybe in some respects, they're right to push her to think harder about it. And they are her parents. But all the same, it, it does put her in a fairly awkward position when she knows that this fellow likes her and she doesn't reciprocate. And she's just forced to spend all this time with him when that might actually make his feelings even stronger. The assumption in all this is, of course, that he is a decent enough human being to not pursue her when he realises that she actually isn't interested. I feel as if she could turn into quite a decent person when she matures a little. At the age of 19, maybe you'd expect to see some signs of that, but nobody's asked her to grow up, so it, it could yet happen. Now, the opening of this chapter is a direct continuation of the previous. This opens with Lydia and her sister Louisa in their bedroom on the same night, when finally Lydia can tell Louisa everything that's happened and what she thinks of it. The bedroom is described in some detail, and some of that's sort of relevant to the story, I guess. They've only been in that room for four years. I'd say since Louisa left the schoolroom and since she left the schoolroom and was moving in to an adult room, a proper adult bedroom, maybe she didn't want to go there alone. So they've moved Lydia in with her or maybe they just graduated Louisa and Lydia from classes at the same time. That's in the past. But by now, this has been their bedroom for four years. We're told that Lady Middlemore removed a four-poster bed from the room, which the author clearly doesn't have a good opinion of four-poster beds, seeing them as gloomy and very old-fashioned. And in its place, Lady Middlemore has brought in two canopy beds, which are very similar to four-poster beds. I had to go and Google it to see what the difference was. Canopy beds also have four posts, but they've got a sort of their own roof. And that probably made a lot of sense in these days when the ceilings were like 14 feet high and who knows what cobwebs and spiders were up there so if you had your own roof you could you could keep safe i get that so they've each got a canopy bed and the canopy beds have pink lined curtains the whole place seems to be very frilly and very feminine and very very maidenly they each have their own side of the room and in their own side, they've got all their own things, their books and their toilet tables, which is like, yeah, dressing tables and such, not, not toilet. And also in the room or off the room is what the author calls a tiny apartment, which seems to be a sort of a balcony, an enclosed balcony. So that is theirs as well. And they've turned that into their private place as you do as you would where they've put in some chairs and a little bookcase and it's a very tight squeeze they filled it with things but they love it it's their favorite place and when they open the windows they've got vines growing up the walls with flowers and it's a it's described very prettily I'd say the author likes flowers because she lists flowers by name all the way through she's always talking about you know the lilacs and the clematis and the Japanese honeysuckle and whatever but as this scene opens it's nearly midnight so they're not sitting in their private room they're just in the main room where in the evenings they brush each other's hair before bed which sort of makes sense because everybody had long hair back then. Girls didn't cut their hair at all. And they wear it up in the day and they wear it in ringlets and whatever else. So at night they let it all out and they spend ages brushing it and make sure there's no knots. Anyway, Lydia and Louisa have this system where they brush each other's hair in the evening and this is the time that they talk. And so Lydia tells Louisa everything that's happened and how 
she can't believe that anybody, I'm paraphrasing of course, she can't believe that anybody would think she would be interested in Mr Mornington. And Louisa says, well maybe he's not as bad as you think. Louisa never comes out and says anything that she thinks Lydia should do and that's a really cool thing about Louisa. Everything she says is actually just pointing out a fact. Like when Lydia says that she really dislikes Mr Mornington, Louisa says, ah, but you disliked your cousins too, didn't you? And yet your cousin Frederick is now one of your favourite people. So she'll go that far. She'll present an argument, but she never, ever, ever tells Lydia what Lydia should do. And yeah, I think that is one cool thing about Louisa. She's about the only person in this book who's like that. Lady Middlemore is, in a way, and is meant to be, but we see inside her head too much. We know that there are times when she wants to do that. There are two things to take away from this scene in the bedroom. One is the existence of Cousin Frederick. At this point, we don't know anything about him other than Louisa using him as an argument against Lydia reading too much into her dislike of Mr Mornington. But having read the book before, I actually think it's fair enough to call attention to this now. It's just worth noting. We've got this cousin Frederick. I think if, if she went over and wrote the book again, she'd probably make him a bigger part of this conversation. The other takeaway here is Lydia is worried about becoming an old maid. And she says she'd rather be an old maid than be married to somebody who she dislikes or who she has no respect for. But she's afraid of being an old maid. She's afraid of the ridicule. Because, as she says, and I'll read it out, people do so always laugh at unmarried women after they are no longer young and seem to think they are unmarried because none wish to have them for wives. Louisa says, well, you don't have to worry about that. We'll make sure everyone knows you had an offer of marriage before you were 20. L Louisa says that as a sort of joke. Lydia does take the point that maybe she shouldn't be worrying about that, but she is. And I think that's a good thing to have brought out in this story, that in that time, women were expected to get married and there was a huge pressure to conform. And of course it was much worse then because women couldn't really get jobs. That the only jobs around in those days for women had very poor working conditions and very low wages. And you certainly couldn't live comfortably on them. There was a range of difficulties in being a woman alone. And all of this is part of the reason that Sir William wants her to make a good marriage. He's not really as evil as he comes across to us these days, not just disregarding her opinion but he does he does think that she's made her decision too lightly and maybe she has but given she can't possibly know what it is that she's turning down by turning down Mr Mornington what he's doing is absolutely rotten forcing her to spend time with this man but but he's not doing it because he's evil he is doing it because it really would help her later in life if if she can find it in her heart to like Mr Mornington. And I guess he knows her well enough to know that she does take these sudden dislikes to things and to people. It does seem to be the case. And when she does, she doesn't even give them a chance. It's very black and white. If she doesn't like something, it's all bad and everything associated with it is bad. And if she does like something or someone, then they can't do any wrong. So Sir William, I guess, knows this, which is why he's asking her to put this bit of extra time into it. So they go to bed and then we jump back to Lady Middlemore. There's a real contradiction in Lady Middlemore's character, I think, and I'd say at this point the author is starting to realise that because she opens the next section in defence of Lady Middlemore, how she really does love her daughters and it might not seem that way because she just fell asleep so easily the night before, but actually all of her children are always in her thoughts and she worries about them and she makes decisions based on their needs and and even though she doesn't seem to be spending time with them she's always working for their good. So we learn at this point that Lady Middlemore also doesn't think 
Mr Mornington is a good match based on his behaviour last night. Not that he did anything wrong, but just the fact that he was the fact that he came across a bit clumsily and didn't really say anything clever and slurped his tea and the way he looked which obviously he was wearing gloves that were slightly too small for him he made a very poor impression so based on all that she's thinking well he's not being very persuasive and she regrets that because she actually would like Lydia to be happy and she at first, she thought from the first, it seems, that Mr. Mornington wouldn't suit, although she said nothing. But she's wishing very much that he was a different sort of person and that he would suit because she would love to see Lydia happy and finding somebody who she cared about. Then we have a bit of Lydia through Lady Middlemore's eyes where it sort of hints that Lydia is Lady Middlemore's favourite child and I don't like that at all. I don't think I don't think it works like that as somebody who has children myself I don't see how you could have favorites children are so different from each other they they're just not comparable and in the last chapter it said something similar that Lydia was Sir William's favorite and it does say that Lydia is the one who is most like Lady Middlemore in personality so Lady Middlemore does understand Lydia better and I do get that, if they're a similar personality. Lady Middlemore says that Lydia has a very intelligent mind, a very active mind, and she's worried that the monotonous daily grind of adult life is going to wear Lydia down and strip all the pleasure of life from her because Lydia loves happiness and excitement and beautiful things and she's unlikely to get that in her future. So this is Lady Middlemore's case really for wanting a good marriage for Lydia and for hoping that Mr Mornington can succeed but she doesn't think he can. And having got that out of the way Lydia then comes into the room and Lydia finally gets to talk to her mother but they actually only have a minute or two before the breakfast bell rings in which time Lydia says, you don't have to say anything. I know that you think the same about Mr. Mornington as I do, and you know that he's not suitable for me. And Lady Middlemore says, I don't know why you would think any such thing. You can't read my mind. And Lydia says, oh, I saw it in your eyes, and I'm always right. And Lady Middlemore is thinking to herself, yes, I, I see things in your eyes in the same way. But... So William has ordered Lady Middlemore to not say a single word that might influence Lydia so she can't actually talk about any of this with Lydia. So she kind of brushes her off and then the breakfast bell rings and they go straight down because Sir William insists that they go straight down to breakfast. You see we're still in the introductory stages here. And then we get a lengthy description of the dining room where they're having breakfast and it's a beautiful description actually. It's, the room is on the ground floor, it has French doors that are open and outside there is a, a veranda that's enclosed in lattice and there are plants and vines growing up the lattice. This is where we get clematis and lilac and such things. The beams of the sun are sort of pilfering through the plants and they're leaving this greeny rippled effect on the floor in the dining room which is a really nice scene and my great-grandparents house did something similar they had trees right up against their veranda and I know just what she's talking about it's a really lovely sort of light you don't see it much these days you know, it's a really a very filtered light and through this or at the other end somehow she's got these both these things happening you can actually see the lawn there are velvety lawns that come almost to the veranda so that the, the carpet in the dining room nearly meets the velvety lawn that's because the veranda isn't wide and you can see the forest on their estate just on the other side of the velvety lawn so it's a lovely scene and there's just the parents and the four girls so I'd say the boys are off to boarding school and she describes how Sir William is sitting at the table in his armchair. He has an armchair at the table and he's got his glasses and his pen are sitting beside him and he's waiting for the morning post and the papers 
and Lady Middlemore is sitting at the table with Fanny who is full of energy and all over the place and Lady Middlemore absolutely has her hands full with Fanny, keeping Fanny quiet and giving her food and such and Flora is sitting there and it says that Flora is neither girl nor woman and shy in company but she's happy and talkative here among her own family. And Louisa is at the tea table and Lydia is serving her parents. So I'd say Louisa is pouring the tea and then Lydia is bringing the cups over to the parents. So that's our breakfast scene. And while they're at the table, some flowers are delivered, two baskets of flowers. One is a basket of datura, another is a basket of uh, various exotic flowers. And they have been sent from Mr. Mornington because Lydia said last night that she had never seen datura. So these are datura blossoms for her, but he's addressed the baskets, one to Louisa and one to Lydia. And Sir William is very pleased about this and points out that this was a very gentlemanly thing for Mr Mornington to do, to not just direct it at Lydia, who obviously is the one that he wants to give something to, but to include Louisa in it as the elder daughter, because that's only polite. And Lydia is forced to say, yes, yes, it was a nice thing for him to do. And she does love the flowers, but she says it very grudgingly and she's not really prepared to give an inch more than that. Fanny is so impressed with the flowers that she keeps handling them and she's very rough with them and she's almost damaging them. So in the end, Lady Middlemore sends Flora and Fanny off to start lessons for the day. And here we have an example of how Lady Middlemore is raising her daughters, I think, because when Fanny gets too much, she just sends her off. Now, she doesn't have much choice because Sir William would not let Lady Middlemore leave the table and the rest of the family continue their breakfast in peace. Along with the flowers came a message from Mr Mornington to Sir William referring to a plan to go on a day trip, which apparently they talked about last night, but it wasn't actually in this book. So I'd say, since this was just written on pen and paper back in the days when you had to do that, I think the author probably didn't really know where she was going to go with this the night before, so she's invented this day trip. So apparently the night before, Fanny would like to go to a nearby town and see a new manufactory that's been built there. And so William can't refuse Fanny, apparently, so he said, well, maybe we could make a trip of it. And both Louisa and Lydia expressed interest in going, so this, they were sort of going to make an expedition of it on this day. And Mr Mornington has sent a message to say he'd like to go too. He has business in that town. He actually doesn't. It's a complete lie. He spends the whole time with them. But that's what he says. He has business in the town so he can accompany them there. So William is very pleased about this and of course sends a note straight back saying you are most welcome. Come have lunch with us and then we'll take off after lunch. And the plan is that Mr Mornington, Mr Charles Mornington, I'm going to have to start using his name, Mr Charles Mornington is going to come over in his, he's got a phaeton, which is a sort of cart, a sort of fancy cart. He's got a phaeton and he's going to come over with his vehicle. So they will have two vehicles for this journey, which means that the girls can split up between Sir William's pony cart and Mr Mornington's phaeton. So obviously the plan is for Lydia to travel with Mr Mornington in the Phaeton and then they have a chance to talk and get to know each other. And that's really obvious to everybody and Lydia, when they go upstairs to put their flowers in the vase, Lydia says, I'm not doing it, I'm going to travel with Papa. And Louisa says, well dear Lydia, all I can say is take care not to vex Papa, you would be sorry afterwards. Which is the closest Louisa ever comes to telling anybody what to do, I think. The two girls spend the rest of the morning in the schoolroom because it turns out that they are the governesses. And it says that this is how the two elder girls spend every morning in the schoolroom with the younger sisters until the younger sisters early dinner. This explains why Lydia was with Fanny when she first had the summons to come to the library yesterday. It's because she and Louisa were in the schoolroom giving 
Flora and Fanny their lessons. Which is obviously going just as you would expect when you think that what she was doing was dressing a kitten in Fanny's doll's clothes. So you can see how much education these younger girls are actually getting. And the other thing about that is, I do wonder just how many servants they've got. If Louisa and Lydia are being the governess, and at the start of this chapter, when they're in their bedroom, having their uh, brushing each other's hair and having their talk, it says they don't have a maid. What it says is, no gossiping, prying, dawdling, chattering lady's maid ever came near them night or morning, or even at the time of the dinner toilet, or any toilet at all, except if a ball was in view, and then Lady Middlemore's own steady maid was allowed to lend her assistance. So it does make a sound as if that's their plan, that it's Louisa and Lydia themselves who are saying, we don't want a maid, we want to do it ourselves, and we don't want what we say to each other to be overheard and maybe repeated. But my feeling is, that this has actually come from Lady Middlemore who has influenced them and suggested maybe that if they did have a maid there that that maid would, that they couldn't trust it and they wouldn't be able to speak freely in front of the maid to the point where the girls think that they've thought this through for themselves and they're saying they don't want a maid but it's actually to this extent maybe this is what the author is saying Lady Middlemore is doing because I could see this, she is influencing them, she is their mother, it makes sense. But it does leave me to wonder what servants they actually do have because they're in a big house, they're members of the aristocracy and they've got a large family. You'd expect some servants. We know there's a footman because the opening lines came from the footman. We know that Lady Middlemore has a maid who is sent to help the girls before balls. Yeah, I will be interested to see as the story goes on to see what servants they actually do have maybe they really are so poor they can't afford the servants they should have and it does seem more than ever that the girls are just growing up wild it turns out mr mornington can't stay for lunch and they're all getting ready to go and he turns up in his phaeton and, and it's a very nice modern carriage and he's it's pulled by a perfect pair and he's got a groom on a very classy looking horse riding behind and Lydia does have this momentary pang where she's thinking that's a really nice carriage and they're really nice horses and imagine how it would be if this belonged to me. And then she thinks, but I have to have him as well if I have them and she realises it's not for her. And she jumps up into her father's car. Now this is her plan that she knows her father is too well bred to make an actual complaint so if she gets into the pony cart before he says anything he won't actually cause a scene and tell her to get out and go with Mr Mornington that would just be that that would be unthinkable so that's what she does she springs up she says Papa I will drive you and she jumps up into the driver's seat and she takes the reins and apparently she's promised Fanny that she'll take Fanny out driving for some time and Fanny's very happy about this. So Fanny scrambles up behind her and Sir William, he's not happy at all, but he can't say anything so he just gets in. Which means that there's just Louisa left and Mr Mornington, who is very disappointed, remembers his manners and asks Louisa if she would like to accompany him in the phaeton and Louisa says yes. Louisa doesn't have much choice at this time. Lady Middlemore and Flora are not going. The next several pages are about the drive. I don't know where they live. It says they are in a county that starts with a W. It's this thing that older books often did where they wouldn't actually put the name. So it's W with a long dash which means it's a real place and they're just not naming it. All the books of this era seem to do that. And they are going to a town that starts with a C. So it's C with a long dash. And when they get there, it actually says that it's the county town. I cannot find a British county that has a county town starting with a C. The county town is like the capital, the capital city of that county. But the one I think it is especially since there's a mini factory there and that's what they're doing. They're going to see the mini factory because Fanny wants to see the mini factory and apparently Sir William can't deny Fanny anything. 
I would say that the county that they're in is Warwickshire and the town they're going to is Coventry. Even though Coventry isn't the county town as such, but it is a very major place. It was industrialised and the author herself grew up in Warwickshire, so she would know that place quite well. So that's my guess, that they're in Warwick, so they're going to Coventry. And it's a journey of about two hours. A lot of this two hours is described in the book. At first, Lydia drives in front, because of course in those days, you didn't have driver's licenses. So anybody, if you could, if you could control your horses, you could drive on the road. And it's an interesting thing to see that Lydia is a good driver and likes to drive. So Lydia is in front and Mr. Mornington is disappointed, but from his position behind, he can watch Lydia drive and he finds that very engrossing. So he spends all the time watching Lydia drive, but it's a bit hard because he's got two horses and they want to go faster and in the end, Lydia pulls over and lets him go past. And until this happens, he's basically ignored Louisa. In fact, not deliberately ignored her, but just kind of forgotten she's there because he's kind of lost in admiration over Lydia's driving. But now that he's in front, he remembers that Louisa is there and he starts talking to her. And they actually talk for the whole journey and they have a really good talk about Highlands, his estate, and things around the town and Louisa enjoys the talk very much. We do see Mr Mornington as a much nicer person here. He's at ease. Louisa learns that he is actually quite intelligent and that his father suffers from ill health and they were forced to move to Switzerland just after buying the place. So his family are actually away. He's on his own here and he's staying back to manage the estate and he's been learning all about it and how to do it. And he seems to be doing a great job and Louisa is quite impressed by that. And they do have a really good talk. And Charles Mornington starts, we, we do see some of this from his perspective. He comes across as a really nice guy, especially when he's with somebody with whom he's not feeling awkward. And then they get to town. And when they get to town, Lydia leaves them. Apparently the plan was, and I'm not sure he knew about this plan, Lydia and her father maybe knew. The plan was that Lydia was going to visit her good friend who lives in the town. She is the wife of the family physician. So the family physician is Dr. Leonard and his wife is Mrs. Leonard. Mrs. Leonard and Lydia are good friends. It's not quite an equal relationship, I don't think. Mrs. Leonard is a learned woman. She's a woman of strong intellect and education and she reads serious books and philosophizes and is very interested in using her brain and since Lydia is much the same she has she's taken Lydia under her wing as it were and I think she's like a second mother to Lydia that's how she comes across not so much a friend but the second mother but Lydia loves spending time with Mrs Leonard and because Lydia does have a good brain that she never gets to use she finds it very stimulating there and it's very deeply satisfying and it does say that Sir William doesn't really believe in women reading books but he doesn't see any harm in Mrs Leonard and Mrs Leonard takes care to stay away from anything approaching scepticism that's the word that you see in the book so everything that she shows Lydia there is nothing that's going to challenge her religious beliefs or destroy her morals in that way and that's how Lydia spends this couple of hours in town and once again of course Charles Mornington is deeply disappointed because the only reason he's actually going is to spend time with Lydia and she managed to avoid the whole drive-in it was a two-hour drive-in that he could have spent with her and didn't and now she's not even, even going to be there for the visit to the manufactory but he makes the best of it so they go along to the manufactory where which is it was Fanny who wanted to go here and I feel like they didn't treat Fanny very well with this because Fanny is a very bright active child she's out of control yes but she's got the makings of an intellectual herself and they go along to this manufactory and she, she can't hear and you know she's only little her head is down here when all the rest are up here and 
the tour guide is talking to the adults just straight over her head and she can hardly hear anything and she can't see and and she's feeling very disappointed and she's trying her best but she's not and so she's getting a bit upset and Charles Mornington picked her up and carried her around so she could see better and pointed things out and this is all kind of new to him as well but he's picking it up reasonably well so he's explaining things in the way that he knows and he did a fantastic job and given that he's actually so deeply disappointed and he's just spent this whole afternoon he he's coming along just to spend time with Lydia and she's not even there and here he is babysitting the little sister instead but you'd never catch a glimpse of that so at the end of this chapter I have to admit I am team Charles he does a wonderful job but after the manufactory visit, they go off and have ices somewhere and pick up Lydia and then they set off home. And this time, Sir William insists that Lydia travel with Charles Mornington because Sir William knows that was the point of it all. So he and Louisa and Fanny set out in the pony cart and Lydia and Charles Mornington set out in the phaeton and it's very unfortunate because Lydia has just spent this three hours with Mrs Leonard and they've been talking all kinds of deep intellectual things which are never actually named but we are told that they are just using their brains and and Lydia is sort of abuzz with the pleasure of stretching her intellect and everything but we're not actually shown that in any way but what we have is we know that She's just had this wonderful afternoon with somebody with whom she's very compatible and now she's with Charles Mornington and Charles who spoke so well with Louisa is back to being monosyllabic because Lydia tends to put him on the spot all the time but she's letting him ramble on a bit. It says in this book that it's evening, it's early summer like it's feeling like a summer's day and it's a beautiful day and the trees are lovely and the birds are chirping and the air is balmy and it's all quiet and you couldn't have anything more romantic and it's exactly the sort of thing that Lydia likes and the author tells us that if Charles only had big doughy eyes or if he could only recite some poetry or if he could do anything like that anything artistic that Lydia would probably change her mind about him on this journey but he can't and all he's really got to talk about is his own place his estate and the manufactory that he's just seen which is the exact antithesis of artistic so he's so Lydia basically her attention wanders off and he's there just rambling away thinking she's quite entertained because he's telling her about Highlands and his plans for the place and he's kind of telling her because you know this could be your plans too you could have a part in this if you have any opinions share them we could make them happen together but she's not even hearing that she's just looking at the trees and the birds and then she touches his arm he's mightily surprised he's because she hasn't touched him at all before he's very very surprised and she says pull over pull over and they've pulled over because she's seen some wild honeysuckles that she wants to pick so she jumps out of the phaeton almost before it's drawn to a halt and she's off running down the hill into the woods to grab these honeysuckles that she's seen and the pony cart pulls up behind and Fanny jumps out immediately and runs off after her and Charles Mornington well there's not really much else he can do is there so he jumps out as well to go and help carry them for her and the scene jumps to Sir William who is really annoyed about all this because he'd asked dinner to be delayed but if they have this stop that they might be late and he's very concerned that he says it's one hour 20 minutes to dinner and it's going to take us one hour 15 minutes to get there and I don't want it to be burnt and Charles Mornington is staying for dinner because he's been invited and Sir William is very keen to show how good the meals are at the Grange he's showing off to Charles Mornington but all he can do is sit and wait and Louisa waits with him but it it's quite clear that the issue is Fanny is quite out of control and then Fanny goes even further away and then 
Charles Mornington runs off after her because he realises that she's gone way too far away. And while he's gone to fetch Fanny back, Lydia comes back to the road with her arms full of honeysuckle and says, why did you wait? We've got two horses. We'll catch you up in no time. At which Sir William, very, very worried about his meal, just whips up his horses and goes off. Now, when I say whips up, that didn't always mean the whip touching them. It was just the crack in the air. I like to think that's what's happening here and that he's not actually touching the horses. So off he goes. And Lydia's back in the phaeton waiting and Charles turns up in the end. He's got Fanny over his shoulder. She's kicking and screaming and pummeling him and basically tantruming. But she's also giggling excitedly because she's sort of got no self-control. She's really it. So anyway, obviously they've got to bring Fanny with them now and she sits between them. So there was no more chance for a talk for Charles Mornington then either because Fanny's sitting between them. And it says, I'll read this because I don't think I could express it as well as the author does. Fanny, whose spirits had risen to an uncontrollable pitch, continued laughing and talking so incessantly, first to her sister and then to Mr. Mornington, pelting them both occasionally with honeysuckles, that he, poor man, gave up all hope of any comfortable conversation with the fair Lydia. Anyway, Fanny is just hyper. And clearly nobody has any control over her at all. I mean, they'd never have come back if it wasn't for Charles Mornington bodily picking her up and carrying her back. You just wonder what would have happened if he hadn't been there, if it was just Sir William and Louisa and Lydia and Fanny and they'd pulled up. Would Sir William have just sat there for hours fuming because he had no way of getting her back? They do make it back in time for tea, only just. And that's where I'm leaving this chapter. So my further thoughts on that. I do think we're seeing some very rigid control from Sir William here. And I do think it's true the girls are out of control. We haven't seen the boys yet, so I'm pretty sure they're off at boarding school. Sir William is driving himself. He doesn't seem to have a groom here. Charles Mornington does. He had the groom on the high-spirited horse who presumably held the heads of his horses while they were gathering honeysuckle whereas Sir William had to stay with his horse because he doesn't seem to have had anybody else there and what we're seeing so far is that Charles and Louisa seem like the better match but Charles is absolutely besotted with Lydia he's not even noticing Louisa and I do think that with a little bit of action in this chapter, the author's writing style is starting to settle down now. And hopefully from this point, she stops describing things and we just start doing. This story is going to be a lot of toing and froing between Charles Mornington and Lydia Middlemore. And it's good to see Charles in a good light, finally because he made a very poor showing at the start. That was partly because we were seeing him from Lydia's perspective, whereas this time we got him away from Lydia. But I do find it an interesting glimpse into the problems in a privileged household in this era. They probably wouldn't have called themselves privileged because they're struggling for money. And it says they do live in an out of the way corner. They're kind of in the unfashionable Western arm, as it were. But the thing that really strikes me is how aimless their lives are. How they really have no ambitions, they're just living very much in the moment. Because there's really nothing else for them. Because being women in this era, marriage is all that's required. Marriage and being a hostess is all that's ever required of them. And the girls can't do that yet. And looking at their mother, looking at Lady Middlemore and her marriage, it doesn't look all that nice. So it's hard to imagine what they could be doing if they were trying to create a more meaningful future for themselves, a comfortable future. They don't really have many options because they're living in this sort of enforced uselessness. And this contributes to Lydia's inability to see Charles Mornington's strengths because everything that he's good at 
is useful for a part of life that she doesn't even know exists. I also find it rather disturbing how Sir William's ways interfere with Lady Middlemore's ability to be a parent. And this probably extends to other facets of family life that we're not seeing yet. So I'll leave it there. We're at page 60. Next week, I plan to look at pages 60 to 78. Thank you for watching.